Welcome to Citizen Science, stories of science we can do together, brought to you by SciStarter. A young student in India, a landscaper in California, a banker in Beirut. In this episode, we'll hear from citizen science volunteers whose lives were changed in profound ways by their participation in SITSAI projects. For most of us, participating in citizen science projects is a fun, meaningful activity we slot into our daily lives, maybe while doing other things like hiking or gardening or escaping from boring or uncomfortable conversations. Whoa, look at the time. I got to go report on whether the hackberries leafed out. But for some, citizen science has actually been life-changing. True, sometimes those life changes may be negative, like say, You've been happily collecting owl barf pellets and saving them for the owl researcher in ice cube trays stacked neatly in the freezer, but for some reason, your spouse couldn't tolerate them and said, it's either me or the owl barf, cornering you into an impossible decision. But that is not the sort of thing we are going to be focusing on in this podcast, though I might reserve the right to revisit that in future podcasts. But no, this podcast looks at ways citizen science has changed people's lives in positive ways. Really, Bob? Life-changing? Seriously? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, like what? Okay, how about this? Sumit Banerjee was an aspiring young astrophysicist living in a remote city in India, but he had no clear route to achieving his dream. Then, he discovered Disk Detectives, a NASA-based SciStarter affiliate project that's also featured on the popular Zooniverse platform. Volunteers watch 10-second videos of stars from NASA telescopes, looking for any that are surrounded by dusty disks that could indicate planet formation. Sumit began contributing daily, and, well, we'll let him take it from there. I started doing the classifications, and then in a few months, in a few weeks, rather, I, I received this email from one of the uh, one of the research scientists from this detective asking me whether I would like to contribute to the, more to the project outside the universe. And yeah, that was the start. And that was the reasoning behind it. I needed to get something for my grad school application. And that is exactly where I found citizen science, to be precise. So right thing happened at the right time. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's really interesting because... Um, A lot of people come to this sort of as a hobby. You know, they do something else, and then they they find either through Zooniverse or through SciStarter, which is the group that I'm working with, which has Zooniverse sort of within it, um, something to do for fun on the side. uh, But I guess for some people, this is a way into their career. Um, it's it's um, It's an entree to deal directly with scientists, right? Oh, yes, definitely, Bob. At least for me, that was the case because I was looking for experiences, research experiences to mention on my grad school application, and I did not have any before 2019. And citizen science was the perfect place to start with because through citizen science, I came across some of the most intelligent, smartest people that I have ever worked with. And they were friendly enough, they were helpful enough to help me with my applications and it's thanks to them thanks to the citizen science project that i'm a part of right now which uh, helped me not only go through my master's degree completely it has also helped me get into a phd position that i am starting in a few weeks from now so yeah you are absolutely correct when you say citizen science is like an entree for many of us who are looking for a career in science and in academia Anything else you'd like to share? Cannot think of anything right now, but yes, if I have to uh, express my gratitude to citizen science, I would definitely take this uh, this opportunity to do it because I don't think without uh, the support that I have from uh, the scientists that I've been working with for the last two, two and a half years, I would have made into the PhD program that I am into right now. So yeah, thank you Citizen Science and thank you in particular to the group from Dis Detective and uh, Gamma, Gamma, the Burst Chasers project which is about to come online on Zooniverse platform. So yeah, uh, without these uh, these projects, I I don't think I would have never made it to the PhD programs of any institutions. So yeah, thank you very much for helping me out there. 
All right, thanks so much, Sumit. Thank you, Bob, for having me. Sumit's flying to the United States this summer and starting his graduate study at Clemson University in the fall. Now think for a moment how cool this is. Sumit was able to join a NASA project, work hard at being a strong volunteer, and eventually began interacting directly with the lead scientists. He jumped like 10 rungs on the science career ladder, even though he was halfway around the world. If you're a student, you could find a project on SciStarter that interests you, become a top-tier contributor yourself, and it may or may not lead to working directly with the top scientists, but it will definitely give you valuable experience in the field, impress college admissions people, and help you achieve your goals, just as it helped Sumit. An isolated case, you say? Ha! I scoff. Michelle Peters started out volunteering in her hometown of Coloma, California, and has now taken it to a whole new level, helping scientists studying phenology, which is the science of cyclic and seasonal natural phenomena, like when flowers bloom or animals migrate or, or hackberries leaf out. Hey, Michelle, how are you doing? Hi, Bob. Doing well, thanks. Thanks for having me here today. Great. And, and where are you coming to us from? I'm in Coloma, California, which is just east of Sacramento in the Central Oak community, uh, plant community, uh, just below the mountains that reach up to Lake Tahoe. Oh, okay. All right. Beautiful. Wow. Um, so I have it on good authority that we, I mean, we haven't met yet, but I have it on good authority that you are a super volunteer. And uh, I just wanted to have you share your, your journey. How did you become a citizen science volunteer, and what are you? What are you into? I worked in education for a while, and actually the past ten years, off and on, just part time as I raise the boys. And um, I currently am back with one of my jobs, which is the uh, I, I serve as a sort of a facilitator for the evening program for the Coloma Outdoor Discovery School, which is a fourth grade historical program oh, okay. where we do living history immersion. And there's some science in there, of course, too. Um, big focus on Native Americans in the evening um, with my very good friend, Kimberly Shining Star. And um, yeah, so I do that for my paid stuff. But then I, I you know, I was recently uh, freed of some time because our boys are a little older now and realized that I wanted to delve into something else that was like bigger, um, fulfilling, important. It had to be important. And, um, you know, living in California, we basically in Coloma, we have a beautiful winter usually, uh, especially this year with lots of rain. I think it's beautiful because we hardly get that in California. Um, our springtime is amazing right now. The, the, the green is almost like that of Ireland. It's so special. And, um, but after that, you know, we kind of, we've, over the past few years, we slip into this long, hot uh, drought. We have long fire season. We have catastrophic wildfires that are scary. You know, us are in our communities. We, we, I pack my car, I regularly have my list. Like it's that kind of a lifestyle mm. from wow. uh, summer through fall. And it's, um, it's hard and it's, it's a result of climate change. And these things are, you know, we need to study them. We need to look at them. We need to understand them better. We need to figure out ways that we can mitigate the harm that we're doing with our carbon. And so I was just in this headspace with it, you know, that like I needed to find something that would, would work. And recently I've been studying statistics and some computer science and things. And uh, I ended up thinking, you know, I want a data project that involves the environment that's going to be important. And at the same time, the American River Conservancy reached out and they said, hey, you know, we're looking for a volunteer amongst the volunteer list that they sent it out to. Um, who's interested, is anyone interested in leading a phenology program? Because they just did, don't have time. They're very focused on conservation efforts, which are very important around our watersheds, uh -huh. the South Fork American River, the headwaters, the Kasumnas River. And, oh, and can and, you explain what phenology is for uh, some of the listeners or viewers that may not know? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So, um, well, I mean, it was a very serendipitous thing that they asked and I thought, yes, let's do it. So, um, one of the definitions is it's the study of cyclic and seasonal natural phenomena, mm -hmm. um, in, in relation to climate and plant and animal life. So we study what are called phenophases, 
which are just the life cycle events of plants and animals. So we're looking at leaf out, typically in the spring for most species. We're looking at flowering, fruiting, falling leaves. And we also look, um, we can observe the animals that interact with these plant species as well. And um, so phenology is a really wonderful thing because it, it contributes so like just the things that, what I love about it is that these are things that a lot of us are already doing. In fact, I would probably put money on that every single human on the planet notices some phenophase every year, whether it's mm -hmm. in the city and you notice, oh, the mosquitoes are out now, or you notice that your favorite flower is blooming, the daffodils are coming up, um, something like that. So unfortunately for some people, it's, it's, oh, allergy season, here it is, uh -huh. you know, um, so uh, plants have um, a vital role in telling us about climate change because they, some of them can adapt and some of them cannot. And when you have, um, rising temperatures earlier in the year, you can have an earlier leaf out and you can have a species uh, starting its life cycle for the growing season a little earlier. But, you know, will that bee that's matched with that species come out earlier as well and be able to have its normal interaction and fulfill its responsibility uh, with that species? Uh, so we're looking at those relationships and when they don't match, it's called a phenophase mismatch. And these things are really important to researchers. So, um, what we do with this program is we collect data, and it's any one of us, participants, citizen science, you know, any person can observe on these plants and note um, what's going on with them, and they can become an observer um, on the USA NPN website, and they can uh, put this data in, and the cool thing is it's in cooperation with so many organizations like the USGS, USDA, NASA, you know, they're looking at this data that's put in by everyday people like you and me and using it to help predict and build models mm -hmm. that can lead to all kinds of things to help us with our food supply, to help us with understanding allergy season, um, just so many things that can happen with it. And I feel like it's a very empowering thing for just an everyday person to do. Great. So what are your plans now? You've, uh, I guess you've been involved in the phenology project for a while. Um, uh, what's happening with that? Are you doing more? Are you, are you, uh, are you where you want to be? Well, interestingly, I'm actually in the spring cohort of the leadership program, which is just finishing this week. So I'm actually about to launch my phenology program with the American River Conservancy within about two or three weeks from now. Um, so we have, um, I have been leading volunteers to get their observer certification, which anyone can do. You can go right now to the USA NPN, check out the species, start your observer certification. You could do that on your own. Uh, we've been setting up our personal sites and just kind of cheering each other along with that. And so the next step is to create a site at what's called Wakamatsu, which is a historical site. It's a, a land uh, that the American River Conservancy owns and has a lot of resources. Um, and so we'll be setting up an actual monitoring site there as well. That's our first goal, um, to educate volunteers as to, you know, collecting data, entering it, getting familiar with the species, having a good time. That's, that's such a great thing about phenology too, is we're out here to enjoy our environment, have a good time. Um, it can be a source of relaxation for people while you're contributing something really important. So, um, and then in the future, we plan to develop educational programs. Um, I do talks for them for their California naturalist certification courses, just little pieces to get people, you know, a little earworm, like here, this is what phenology is and you're probably already doing it. So little things like that. And then eventually some more detailed, um, educational programs for every age. Well, thanks so much, Michelle. Thanks for sharing. Thanks, Bob. Tracking climate change is an enormous undertaking, and it's enormously important, too. If you want to help, you'll find dozens of climate-related research projects at SciStarter, including Nature's Notebook, Journey North, I See Change, and so many others. Finally, we have another amazing SITSci-based life transformation right here on the SciStarter staff. Roland Mondelec worked in banking in Beirut, Lebanon, with an interest in recreational biking and hiking. Hey, Roland. Thanks for being with us. Hey, Bob. I'm excited to be on your podcast. Yeah. yeah. So how, well, actually, before we get into the whole um, 
uh, science volunteering stuff. I'm just a little curious, and I think people might be, because you're coming to us from Beirut, Lebanon, right? Yeah, yeah. How it's is it? I, we have a cartoon version of Beirut here. Um, I'm sure you have a cartoon version of Washington, D.C., too. Um, but what's it really like? Where are you? Um, uh, we have this image of it as being this war zone or something. Yeah, so, so the war is over uh, since many years. Uh, we still have our own challenges, our daily struggles, but it is a really beautiful country. Uh, naturally and culturally, we're a very diverse demographics. So it's a really exciting place to be. And uh -huh. uh, it's where you, you learn to be resilient. You have to be resilient and you have no other option. But yeah, once you get used to it and you start to know how to live and enjoy yourself, it's not such a bad place after yeah. all. Yeah, And you clearly had time and uh, space and the ability to do some science volunteering. When did you first um, begin being a citizen scientist? I first learned about citizen science maybe in 2013, around that period. I purchased a phone and it had this built-in app uh, that lets you volunteer computing power when you're not using it or when you are charging it. Uh, it's called Boink. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was uh, a rebranded version uh, called HTC Power to Give. And that's where I started uh, reading about citizen science and I got more and more excited about it. So I downloaded the app on my laptop and uh, I've been running it for years until I started with the Size Starter. And uh, yeah, and even before I started with Size Starter, I volunteer a little bit with a local citizen science in initiative in Lebanon. Um, so yeah, I, I was uh, pretty sure that's where I wanted to shift my career because I was a banker. So it has nothing to do with uh -huh. science. Huh. Yeah, and I neither studied banking nor science, so I have a Master of Arts in Media Studies. It has a little bit with what I'm doing with the size starter regarding communications and social media and so on. Uh, but yeah, now I'm in my comfort zone in the career that I really want. Oh, wow. So having your computer used passively for other, other purposes, um, that's a pretty... You know, you don't really have to pay much attention to any science or anything. It just kind of happens. What did you do after that that started getting you more involved? I started getting more involved with uh, projects such as Zooniverse and uh, other projects where uh, the barrier to entry is pretty low. Uh, and uh, more and more, I started discovering other projects. And now I have this uh, air quality monitor, which I... Uh, I hang on my bike whenever I go do some cycling and I simply monitor my environment. I'm pretty sure I'm the only one in this country who uses this device. So yeah, it's exciting to be one of the, of the few people who are spreading the, world, the word about citizen science. And what project is that where you do the air quality uh, monitoring? It's Habitat Map. Uh, Habitat Map, okay. Yeah, or air casting. Okay. And they just get yeah. it automatically um, you're, as you're biking around, it's measuring air quality and it, it, it automatically goes to them? Yes, it, uh, it takes measurements periodically. And once you're back, you simply sync it with your phone and it uploads it, uploads it to the Internet, to this uh, worldwide map where you can compare your results with other uh, countries. And I was pleasantly surprised that the uh, pollution levels weren't as... Uh, as uh, bad as I initially thought. So yeah, huh. they, they aren't uh, perfect either, but uh, right. it's good to know. Huh. And so then, you know, our listeners and viewers may not know, but uh, you eventually got involved with SciStarter and now do work um, for SciStarter. How did that happen? Uh, I simply emailed them and uh, I sent, I've sent an email to SciStarter's email so there was no job placement uh, and I had no idea, I wasn't very optimistic about having anyone reply back and I was pleasantly surprised when Darlene replied within like 20 minutes. So <laughs> She's I always monitoring. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, so uh, the initial feeling was, okay, that's too good to be true. Then I started doing th- some work and I was still working at the bank. So I spent several months working, having these two jobs, which was a little tough, but certainly worth it. And then I left the bank and uh, started full time with Sci Starter. And oh, it's I didn't something know you were I really. Time. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, so this is, so this is, uh, um, we just have to uh, tell our viewers that Roland works for Sci Starter. Uh, I work part time as podcaster, but you're working full time. Uh, and now you're getting other people interested in citizen science. <laughs> yes, yes. It's, it's so something cool. I like to advocate for. Yeah. So uh, what else? What Do you have any advice for people who um, may not be scientists, but, um, you know, may be sort of curious about citizen science and, and how to get involved? Yeah, definitely. So I never wanted to have a career in science and I never worked for it, but I've always wa- uh, loved uh, and I've always been interested in science topics in the format that, uh, that allows uh, regular people to understand them. So uh, I sometimes I read articles, I subscribe to some YouTube channels to keep myself updated. And uh, citizen science is a great way to, to improve your science literacy and to do good. So uh, first you have to ask yourself the question if you want to volunteer in anything. And if the answer was yes, citizen science is a great way to volunteer and you have a wide range of projects, trustworthy projects you can help with, which would uh, obtain information that they wouldn't otherwise. Because uh, especially in my case in Lebanon, where uh, scientific research is much less uh, active compared to the US, for example. So uh, I think in these places, citizen science is even more important to give a broad look of, of the globe. Uh, whether it's on biodiversity or other things. So it's a great way to feel productive and uh, to teach science to your students if you're a teacher. And uh, if maybe, I don't know, if you're a retired person, it's a great way to feel productive. Great. All right. Thanks so much, Roland. Thank you. Today, Roland's working full-time for SciStarter, helping to get others involved in citizen science in hopes that their SITSci adventures can be as fulfilling and rewarding as his have been. Well, that's all we have for you this episode. In May, we'll be coming to you live from the annual Citizen Science Conference in Tempe, Arizona, or at least recorded with live enthusiastic attendees there. I'm Bob Hershon. I'll see you then. This podcast is brought to you each month by SciStarter, where you will find thousands of citizen science projects, events, and tools. It's all at SciStarter.org. That's S-C-I-S-T-A-R-T-E-R dot O-R-G. SciStarter's founder is Darlene Cavalier. And thanks so much to you, the listener and the citizen scientist, for getting involved and making a difference. If you have any ideas you want to share with us or any things you just want to hear on this podcast or you just want to say hi, get in touch with us at info at SciStarter.org. Once again, our email address is info at SciStarter.org. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs>